welcome to the Veterans View Show slash Community Involvement. And today I have my sidekick with me, Pop Barnes from Columbus, Georgia. Pop is a retired Army man, and uh, he has a show over there called All About Veterans. So we're going to tag team today's table talk, Pop Barnes, myself, with the mayors and the sheriffs and the police chiefs. And we're going to go around and let each person introduce themselves. And we'll start with Sheriff Taylor. Hello, my name is Heath Taylor, and I'm the sheriff in Russell County, Alabama, and uh, we appreciate being here today. Good morning, George Stottinger. I'm the Game City Police Chief. I uh, was appointed Tuesday <coughs> to the council meeting in honor of the department for 30 years. And I'm Ray Smith, the former chief of police, now public safety director, uh, continuing to help support the public safety effort here in Russell County, Big City. We look forward to discussion talking about some solutions that we can share across the city area. My name is Lance Deaton. I am the De Deputy Chief of Police in Columbus, Georgia, and uh, looking forward to uh, to these discussions and the partnerships that we have and looking forward to continuing to, to build these partnerships across the board. Yeah, and I'm Mayor Skip Henderson from Columbus, Georgia. I want to thank uh, Mr. Davis and of course my Councilor Bob Barnes here for uh, for kind of facilitate this discussion because as my friend Mayor Eddie Lowe says all the time, we are one region and anything that impacts one side of the river impacts the other. So we're just grateful to be included. And I do want to say that we are expecting Mayor Lowe to come in. He's had to attend another meeting and we're also expecting Sheriff Countryman to come in. So when we take a station break, we'll take the station break and bring them on into the show. But Pop, introduce yourself and tell the people something about you. Now, Columbus know about you, but we're going to talk about that thing. City Council Councilor Pop Barnes been on Council seven, it's been 17 years, 17 years with the, um, the present mayor. Uh, it was a pleasure for him being on the City Council. He's now the Chief Executive of Summer Exchange of Mayor. And, and in conversation with Leroy, Leroy and I, we tag team each other because we're all about veterans. You know, the men and women who put on the uniform that really uh, protect the precious freedoms that we have. But also, let me just say something public safety. I'd like to preface what I'm saying is because I told some people we're going to be doing this here. With all that's going on with uh, all over this nation, with the mass shootings and all, here in this area, <coughs> Phoenix City and Columbus, it's the, with all that's going on, it's the utmost uh, respect and support of public safety. Because you can have the best amenities in the world on both sides of the river, and people don't feel safe, they're not coming out. But the people are definitely coming out because they have the confidence in our public safety. So, with that being said, now we'll we'll get to the basic reason finished? why we're here. We want to talk about gun violence. And we want to let you know how good the men and women in uniform for our police department, sheriff department, and both cities are doing the work that you're paying them to do. But they still need your help. When you see something, you need to say something. So we're going to start off with a question, and uh, and we can go around like we did the last time and to answer these questions. And the first question is, does gun violence impact some people more than others? And who would like to take that first? <laughs> I think certainly it does. I think uh, the, it, it, is, it has begun to affect a broader spectrum throughout, not just our community in, in Phoenix City, I'm sure, in, in Russ County, but but also uh, around the around the country. But historically, a lot of this gun violence has been centered in areas that have lower socioeconomic opportunity. Uh, and, and, that's, and, and that's why when we talk about this, I hope we'll continue to focus not just on the enforcement, which is critical. It has to be effective. It has to be efficient. But there also has to be a commitment to providing resources to people who are in these uh, economically depressed areas and feel a sense of hopelessness. We got to reinstill that hope. We got to provide opportunities, and we've got to continue to try to fund those type of resources as well. Anyone over here? You you got to you also got to reach out to that community and let them know that we can protect them if they come forward with information. Um, we can do our best to protect them. Um, oftentimes, they know who are doing the shootings and who's doing the drive-bys and who's doing those types of things. But they're scared to come forward, and, and you can simply understand where they're coming from. They have to live there, and they have to raise their kids there, and 
And so they're they're afraid to come forward and deal with the law enforcement. But I think the the safer we can make it, the better they'll be able to do that. And I, I think if they trust us, um, which is everything, then I think you'll be able to have a little bit better handle on it. Anyone else? Maybe to piggyback off the sheriff, um, one thing, the, the reluctance to um, give information, if, if the word on the street is there's a homicide and the word on the street is this person did it, obviously we're working, we're talking to witnesses, we're trying to gather enough evidence and statements to make that arrest, which is difficult at some times, but it, it's also probably hinders our, our ability to investigate those if, if the person's or if there's a homicide and somebody's arrested and they make bond and they're back on the streets, or um, somebody's pending trial and it's been four, three, four, or five years. Uh, COVID, our, our court system, that was devastating to prosecution of these cases. So our DA, Rick Chancy, that's his top priority right now, is there's a backlog of cases. There already was a backlog of cases just due to the shortages of personnel and the volume of cases, but COVID just made that a tenfold um, bigger issue. So they're trying, I know they're trying to work through that with the county cases as well as the city cases to get those cases prosecuted and get some convictions and get those folks that are committing those crimes where they need to be. Okay, yeah, I was going to go into one more thing. There's some, sometimes there's some unintended consequences when we talk about you know, laws that have been passed here recently. I mean, you've, you've had the pandemic and you've had a little bit of an uptick on, on crime. Some of that can be attributed to the lack of prosecutions, which we're hoping to get across. Uh, some of that um, just because people were shut up and there was a lot of uh, spare. And to, to the mayor's point, Mayor Henderson's point, you know, people have lost hope in, in a lot of communities and trying to rebuild that hope. And coming out of that pandemic, I think will help us move forward. But in Alabama and Georgia here recently too, you know, passed some um, gun legislation. That gun legislation relaxed a lot of the gun requirements, the permitting requirements, both in Alabama and Georgia. And quite frankly, that you know, irrespective of what side of the the argument you stand on that, whether you're pro uh, Second Amendment or a little bit of less or more restrictive in the Second Amendment. There has been an unintended consequences of that, coupled with that more fearful community attitude, as well as the prevalence of more people having and carrying guns both in their cars and on their person. But that leads to more opportunities to have these guns become used in conflicts. Not only that, but whenever they people leave their guns in cars, for example, that's been a huge problem in Phoenix City, I'm sure, close too. Guns being stolen out of cars means that there are more guns. <coughs> Being illicitly traded in the in the black market because those guns are now more and more available in cars. Um, so, as an educational you know standpoint, carrying guns is a huge responsibility, and with that responsibility comes responsibility of securing that weapon. If you're going to carry your gun in your car, secure that with some kind of box tape in your car. Make it somewhat at least don't put stickers on your car that indicate that you're probably carrying a gun in your car because when it's parked park at a shopping center or park at a park, that makes it more of a target for these. And those thieves are, again, they're bad guys, and so those thieves are going to use those guns to do other bad things, as well as give them to younger folks, juveniles, that may be uh, looking for one, because, again, it goes back to this uh, argument that there are some that have, they don't have any hope, they don't have any fear of consequences. We need to get them back to the opportunity to say, look, I need to have some fear because that's going to hurt my ability to be successful in the future. If they don't feel like they're going to be successful in the future, then there's no fear for them to get in trouble in the here now. If we can help them know that there is something for them on the other side when we get past these uh, these tough times, that we're going to be there for them, we're going to support them, we're going to make it. So that, that'll hopefully change their outlook and say, even if they do come in contact with a gun or come, you know, have a gun made available to them, they can turn away from that temptation and focus back on what they need to do to make their self successful. Yeah, great, great. I, I think one of the things to, to kind of piggyback off of the, the sheriff and, and the chiefs that we're seeing in Columbus, and, and we're, we're dealing with the same issues uh, on both sides of the river, and there's no question about that, but we're seeing a, a, a heavy uptick in uh, youthful gun offenders and uh, youthful gun, gun uh, uh, violence victims. Um, very, uh, just in the last couple of weeks, we've had several uh, shootings and homicides that involve, you know, kids the age of 14 and 15 years old. 
Um, so I, I, I think we have to start looking at how do we how do we address some of those issues? How do we get these kids um, doing something productive? Let's occupy their time doing other things. I, I can remember as I as I was growing up, my dad used to tell me, if you're a football practice, if you're a practice, if you're a baseball practice, you're doing something, then your time's occupied, there's no time to get in trouble. And so how do we how do we how do we make our parents and our kids understand that there are other options, there are other things that we can be doing to be productive to remove yourself and your family members from this type of, of interaction and violence. And, and, and I, I worry that, that we got to, you know, and I, my concern is that we don't put enough emphasis on that and we start, we have to start looking at our youth because um, we're, they, they just seem to be getting younger and younger and younger uh, from a victim standpoint and an offender standpoint. Wow. That was great. That was great. So it begs the question now. This is the question. Now. One thing that I always was always a comfort for me when I was overseas is the fact of knowing no one, no country will ever be able to come here and overtake us because we have that right to bear arms. So, from y'all's perspective, what do you think we need to put in place to weed out, you mentioned youthful offenders, so there has to be maybe age guidelines. How, how, how are they getting these weapons? How are these things happening? So from y'all's perspective, because what is really a two-edged sword is it, I always took comfort in other countries knowing you want to know something we, we do have the individual has the right to bear arms. That's precious. But at the same time, in the instance of what's happening now, what do you think we need to put in place? Safeguard measures that will slow the tide of all this gun violence. That's a tough question. Yeah, it's a tough question because you're, you're you're absolutely right. The biggest thing is, is that we need to be re-educating our community and public that with that right of, of freedom of carrying weapons and, and having you know arms with us, that we need to take that responsibility very, very seriously. It's far too many times we're, we're seeing people, new gun owners, not get the proper training. Um, and again, we don't need to mandate that. That just needs to be something that's understood. If you're going to carry a weapon, you need to be proficient. You wouldn't go get a new car and not learn how to drive or, or take some kind of course and drive that thing. And that's a 3,000, 4,000 pound projectile. It's no different than what it violates. And then learning how to secure that. Locking up cars is the biggest thing, and then making sure that those weapons are secure. Because, again, if you can reduce the number of stolen weapons in the community, people who are law-abiding gun owners aren't using their guns in a fair place. People who are stealing guns, if those guns are made available to thieves, that's when they become more problematic. Um, and to your point, too, about education starting early. And, and uh, I remember as a young man, I was taught, you know, either through Boy Scouts or through... Uh, you know, even through school, you know, hunting programs that came into the school, uh, those kinds of things, being familiar and knowing what a gun is and how a gun, what kind of damage a gun can inflict. A lot of these kids sometimes have little or no understanding. What they see on TV is what they think guns are, that people get shot 10, 12 times and they jump up and they survive. That's not the true story of a gun. A gun's very destructive and, and usually a uh, gunshot will kill you. Um, so, you know, there's a social disconnect between what is real and what is not. And, uh, that hopefully, you know, the gun culture is the gun culture and will always be the gun culture in the United States. But what has changed is that now the gun culture is seen as more of a, you know, an intimidation issue rather than a protection self-defense issue. It needs to get back to that self-defense um, issue what, instead of an offensive, you know, I'll protect what I want issue. But do you think that uh, maybe uh, educational programs in our schools with uh, law enforcement uh, teaching uh Something about gun would be something that would help our communities? And help the teenagers know how to use them better. <laughs> and thats I don't know that that's a good thing. I mean, I say that in gist, but I, I don't know that, you know, I'm in a different situation. I've, I've dealt with the permit side of it, and I am a advocate of the Second Amendment but I disagree with everybody under the sun being able to carry a gun in public with nobody looking. That's true. And it's not just the, t the kids, it's our community that has mental health. I mean, we have completely taken the ability away from an officer who catches an 18-year-old doing something, carrying a gun, and we can't do nothing about it. 
we have to let them go and they go do whatever it is they're going to do. Um, and so, you know, we, we've got, we have went from, you know, checking people who want to put a weapon in their car or on their person who used to have to have a permit to now it's everybody under the sun. And if you are a convicted felon and we catch you, okay, we can arrest you. But short of that, 16, 17, 18 year olds who don't have a criminal record yet, they're able to carry whatever they want just about. And there, if there's anybody in the car that's 18, there's nothing we can do about it. And, and we don't look at people who are, who have mental illness, who we know have mental illness because we deal with them in our community on a daily basis. They are free to put a gun in their car. If you look across the state since October of last year, the state of Alabama has had a tremendous uptick in gun violence because of the gun safety. Um, you know, there were the when we were fighting that legislation in, in Montgomery, there were six thousand people in 2022 that tried to get a permit that were denied based on mental health. 6,000 in the state of Alabama. Oct October 1 of last year or January of this year, they were able to put a gun in their car and carry it on their hip anywhere they want to go. We know that there were 6,000 that had mental health that was denied because of a mental health issue. Those 6,000 people are carrying a gun right now. And if you think their mental health issue is any better, then I got some property to save because it's just not. I mean, it, it's just not. We're dealing with the, the young issue. Um, our criminal element is recruiting young kids to do their dirty work. And, you know, it, it's they're using them for that. Well, sure, you brought up something where and I'm sure that our viewing audience, I'm flabbergasted by this here, but this is a, a tremendous handicap for, for public safety. And, and the only pure science is statistics. When you say 6,000 people, that's a lot of folks who are carrying weapons who should not. Absolutely. So let's try to glean something out of this here. What do you, so that, our, and, and I'm sure that our viewing works, they're probably against it as well, but you're facing a monumental problem. What do you, what's the fix for something like this? Well, certainly the, the legislature needs to know, <clears throat> number one, that, and the sheriff speaks to this, because the Chiefs Association as well as the Sheriff's Association both proposed the legislation as it was written. Some of the some of the um, fixes that were so-called put in there was that there was should, there was going to be a creation of a database of certain persons forbidden. Well, that database is not online, and we're almost to the end of this this year. Well, in our opinion, in my opinion, and Sheriff can create or tell you his opinion. I don't think that law should have been enacted until that database was in, in effect. The database would have been effective, and then if I stop somebody and run into that database, and I found my gun, then I could make an arrest. Right now, the database doesn't exist, so my officers or the police department officers can't check for somebody forbidden uh, prohibited from carrying a gun because the mental health records are not complete, the arrest records are not complete. That, that data is supposed to be created by statute; it hasn't been. And I don't know if Georgia has a similar statute, but I know Georgia's uh, permit was carry also went into effect this year as well. But I don't know what backstop there was to help try to continue that enforcement effort, but really they took that tool away from law enforcement without giving us another tool that was mandated by legislature. So calling legislators and either getting that, that tool back in place or at least you know put the permit requirement back in place temporarily until they get it done. That's that's I think a big problem. It, sure. Yeah it, it is. It's it's absolutely a problem. And what Alabama did was you know they were whether you're a member or not, I used to be a member, but NRA is a huge lobbyist and that's their goal. And they pressured the, the legislators. We, in, in our statute that was passed, there was a clause that said, if you get stopped by a police officer at any point, whether it's in the car, in the park, it don't matter. If he asks you if you have a weapon, since it's legal now, you had to tell them if you had a weapon. And if you did not, and they found a weapon, you could be arrested. 
So that was the that was the statute that was in the law. They failed to put any punishment or penalty to that statute. So okay, a deputy, we had it happen. They lied. We find the gun. We make the arrest. And what happened? They had to dismiss it because they couldn't charge them with anything because the legislators didn't put any penalty to that part of the statute. So this year, in the legislative session, we specifically asked for one thing, and that was a consequence for what they had already said was a crime. It was a misdemeanor. But we said, put some, put some teeth to it. Give us the ability to make the arrest that you're said we can make. And they refused to hear it. The legislator refused to take it up. The legislation was completely shut down. And again, it ended with, it's nothing. So, so in essence, we can't do anything about it, even when they lie to us and say that they don't have a gun and, and for whatever reason we may find it. So, I mean, it's, it's a bad scenario that has to be fixed from the legislators in each state. I disagree with what Georgia and Alabama did because both states have said it don't matter if you live here or not, you can bring a gun here. So if I have a criminal element come across the river... We were asking for the law to only apply to an Alabama citizen, to, to have a gun with no permit. Otherwise, we were saying, make them have a permit from Florida, Georgia, Mississippi. If they come to Alabama, make them have a local permit to have a weapon in our state if they're not a citizen. Nope. We're letting anybody bring any weapon into our state and there's not a not an offense. Georgia did the same thing. Florida did the same thing. Florida just passed theirs, and it's just like Georgia's, just like Alabama. It don't matter where you live. You can bring a gun into our state and not have to have a permit. And I, I, I just don't know how us in law enforcement, how you can control that. And uh, it's tough. Yeah. This is getting good. Now, will we get any response from here? So, from the Georgia side, I, I completely agree because we're in the same boat. The, the legislation is very similar, and I do think that that it has to start there. But from from a local law enforcement standpoint, you know, we are we are severely handicapped um, in in dealing with these with these gun issues. But I think we know we we can't give up. We got to continue to fight. We got to continue to to reach out to our our legislators to try to get this fixed. But from a from an enforcement standpoint, and how do we deal with that from you know locally? How do we address these issues under the criteria that we have that we're working under right now? Um, hopefully that does get changed in time. But how do we address that? So I, I think there has to be a a balance of, of of how you deal with this. I think you have there has to be an enforcement piece. And I think in the past, we've taken the enforcement piece as, hey, that's the only way. That's, you know, it's enforcement, enforcement, enforcement. And, and that worked for, for a while. I don't think that necessarily works on its own today. I think there has to be a balance between, you know, the, the enforcement um, of the gun laws as we can and are allowed to enforce it. Um, there has to be an educational piece, um, you know, to... Uh, on a lot of different levels. There has to be an educational piece about how do we secure weapons um, because uh, Chief Smith is exactly right. Uh, you know, entering autos and burglaries are where these guns are coming from. The guns that are used in violent crimes, you know, traditionally aren't bought at a gun store, you know, by a law-abiding citizen. They're stolen from law-abiding citizens and they're, they're being used in violent crimes. So I think there has to be an educational piece. And to the mayor's point, there has to be some, you know, some some city and local and government involvement to to try to address some of these socioeconomic issues that are going on in all of our cities. And it's every and it's across the country. It's not just here in our region. It's across the country. Yes, so I think we have to figure out a balance. I think it takes all of us working together, trying to have a balance of 
of all these different things. And I think when you, you know, and when we've experienced this, where if you get too far one way or the other and you don't have a good balance, then it doesn't have the same effectiveness as it could if we're, if we've got some balance on that and that we're, and if we're all working together, the uh, interdepartmental uh, opportunities to work together, I think helps us because today they're, you know, we're, we're all dealing with manpower issues and we're all dealing with the same issues. The only way to, for us to address and be able to provide the services that we need to provide our citizens is if we're all working together. Sure. We're using each other's manpower. We're using each other's resources. We're trying not to duplicate those resources so we can all work together. So I think it takes a combination of all those things to try to fix these problems. And I'm glad that Chief Davis is, I'm really good that you're having this because I'm, we haven't even been here for 10 minutes and I've been educated to a huge problem. And it is, what you um, mentioned, Sheriff, is, is something that I know our viewing audience realize they have to get involved because y'all, in order for us to feel safe, we have to make sure y'all are safe. And you, you just, your jobs are already difficult. And to have legislators to handicap you even more, there's a number of things that puts you as y'all you know, as individuals in danger because a person can lie, a person can also react. And we need to let our viewing audience know, and I guess we can say it, what they need to do, we you know this is a problem, they need to reach out to the legislators and let them know how your hands are Because this impacts not only y'all directly, but the citizenry of both Alabama and Georgia. But there's one thing that I, I think that the people need to know and the legislators need to know because, what is it, two or three uh, uh, places in the country that's unique, like Phoenix City and Columbus or Russell County and Muskogee County, they're right across the river from each other. So you can do one crime on this side of the river, run over here, and if we don't catch you, you know, you can possibly get away. So both law enforcement still work together and respond to each other with a system. And the legislature has to know, like you got Muskogee County here, you got Russell County here, then you go to Cincinnati, Ohio on one side of the river, you got Kentucky on the other side. So I think we, in a, in a situation like that, we deal with more uh, uh, crime than we need to because of we're so close. And the legislature needs to put some meat, uh, like what the sheriff was saying, give us a something to tie our hands. Well, you're absolutely right, but for the record, the DA's Association, the State Troopers Association, the Chiefs of Police Association, the FOP, and the Sheriff's Association, and the Attorney General all opposed the gun legislation. And regardless of every professional law enforcement association in the state opposing it, it passed. And it wasn't even really close. It, it, it flew through. So, I mean, you've got every professional law enforcement organization saying this isn't a good idea. <clears throat> when they don't listen to you, I don't know what you're going to do to, to change that. Well, one of the things that I always like to say, my grandmother was, was a patriot. And she says one of the things... No matter who's in office, we tell them what we want them to do. And so we have our viewing audience here. And I know <clears throat> many of you are as surprised as I am. So what we need to do, we need to take action because every politician, while included, sends it to that V word called the vote. And so the bottom line, you see how our, our public safety are being hamstrung. And I'm going to be honest with you, if they fall by the wayside, what about our safety? So this is an individual thing, safety for them. You can hear how they're placing their life in even more danger by these laws that are passed. We as citizens need to get behind them, rally behind them, and contact our elected officials and let them know this is what's going on and we need to stop it. Now, uh, this, this conversation is getting real good, but we're going to take a, a, a station break here for a moment. But when we come back, we want to talk, I, I want to hit on the education piece. And the, uh, since you brought up what you just brought up, the positive capitalist, 
And because if we lose our public safety officer, we can't bring the military in. Yes, you know, so we're going we're gonna to come back from this station break and we're going to discuss a piece of the educational piece. to win. 
Welcome back. And we've been having a great panel discussion here, and we want to keep it going. And I, I, it's a piece I want to talk about, uh, like the AR-15 uh, rifle, and you mentioned earlier, Chief Ray, that, uh, you know, kids look at TV and they think that you can take five shots and, and get up, but they don't know the destruction that an AR-15 does to the body. So who would like to speak on that AR-15? <laughs> well, AR-15 is, is a rifle. It's just a type of rifle. So I'm not going to make any, you know, demonization of the rifle itself because it's just a design feature more than anything else. But based on our discussion, we've talked about the legislation, how it was passed, and, you know, how the, that it's not likely to change anytime soon as far as the permitless carry and those kind of things. But interestingly enough, you know, AR-15s and rifles weren't covered by permits anyway prior to that. I mean, carrying a rifle, any, any adult over the age of 19 in Alabama, I think it's 18, uh, 17 Georgia, 18 Georgia, can carry a rifle. Uh, so that, that's it. But rifles, then again, are not nearly as problematic. They're larger, they're harder to conceal. People can see them coming, kind of thing. Um, but to your point, you know, people that may have access to them or get access to them, if they're not educated in the damage and the destructiveness of those weapons, then sometimes they don't have an appreciation of what may come about those weapons. Because quite frankly, there's much more powerful weapons than Air 15s, um, seven millimeter mags, three hundred Winchester mags, those kind of things. But they're a lot, they're a lot not as um, prevalent as you would say. But the Air 15 is just a very popular, easy to handle rifle. <laughs> that if people know and should be trained that they're destructive and dangerous, but they can have a useful purpose in life and tools, you know, using it for hunting. Or even target practice and discipline. Uh, that's one of the things that's kind of an oxymoron. Shooting is a discipline, just like any other sport. You know, playing football or, you know, baseball, it can be a very disciplined sport. And those that are really good at it, you know, have that discipline and have that respect for the sport. And so that's, that's in a lot of ways, my idea. You know, target practicing. Fort Benning used to have a pretty good program for civilian marksmanship program out of Fort Benning. There's one up at Talladega that uh, I like to encourage children to go to in the uh, Surfer Troop County, uh, Boy Scout Troops. They, they try to get into that marksmanship as a merit branch application. But I'd like to see that as something that even in the schools with hunting education, those are very valuable, particularly in our area where we have some ability, even though Muskogee County and Phoenix City has some urban areas, we've got a lot of rural that's close by. That I think you could really benefit on to get some of some some of these um, less disadvantaged children who may not have an opportunity to get out and see that type of, of environment, that kind of country with the, the rural environment. And it just might be an opportunity. That's one way that we could start looking at that because I don't think you're going to change the gun laws any soon. But I think educating, particularly younger children, into the, the respect that's due firearms, I think may help. And, 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 and I'll, I'll I'll chime in on this. And I know I'm old school. And I know I'm probably going to be made fun of. I'm a firm believer that some of the issues that we're dealing with these kids is the video games. I don't care what anybody says. I am of the opinion that it desensitizes our kids to death. And it desensitizes them to abiding the law. When when you've got 10, 11, 12-year-olds doing nothing but sitting in front of a video game playing Grand Theft Auto or, or Call of Duty and all the different ones and all they're doing is going through and killing people and learning how to reload and learning how to do all these things that are tactical because they're playing it on the game and if you watch social media all these events that you see these guys T the, the law enforcement in that area is talking about how tactical they were, how tactically they changed magazines, how they did all these things. And these kids didn't learn that from anywhere but a video game. That's right. And, and so we talk about parenting and we talk about classes and education. I mean, some of it's going to have to be from our parents taking responsibility about what their kids do it, we make fun of my son he's 16 and me and Tom will drive by a tractor and my son will talk about how he can drive that tractor and we're like what are you talking about you never been on that tractor well I got it on my game I know how to do it on my game I can drive a 18 wheeler I can drive a earth mover I can I mean he talks about all these things that he can learn 
on video game. And that's absolutely happening with the other type of games. It's, it's teaching these kids how to kill and desensitizes them to death, in my opinion. And that's just my opinion and a 250 pop, you can buy yourself a cup of coffee. Well, well I know I'm older than you. I'm way older than you, Cheryl. And, and I'm, I'm a firm believer because I've seen it. We have children, my wife and I, we have grandchildren, we have great grands. And it's it mind boggling. By the way, they call us a, a smartphone in America and tell you, only thing I know how to do is turn it on, turn it off. But you, you see these kids and, it, and, and these mass killings where they where they <coughs> they even have war games where they're blowing half cities up. Mm-hmm. And I think that it does, they live in kind of like a, a fantasy world that, that it does make them, it does desensitize them to the value of, of death. And you can even watch the movies where people get half killed. Next thing you know, miraculous surgery and, and, and they're functioning again. So I'm a firm believer that a lot of video games desensitize them to the reality of injury and death. Well, I think the underlying common factor is that, and, it, and Deputy Chief D mentioned it, it's how our perpetrators get younger. Well, they're not physiologically developed to make the type of mature decision that comes from being able to carry a gun. And I, I mean, I remember being a kid, you, you see fights pop up instantaneously because they can't control their anger and they can't. Well, imagine if those kids happen to have, I don't know, a weapon in their pocket. They don't think, they don't, they don't, uh, you know, I've talked to, to sheriffs that have said when, when, they're the baddest dude in town when they're out there pulling that trigger at 15 years old. You see them an hour later sitting in the jail crying for their mom. Right. Mm-hmm. Because it's hit them that they've killed right. somebody and that their life is not over is severely altered. Right. So it, there's, and I don't have, I don't have a, a, a magic wand, but, but there's got to be a way, and I don't know any other way than, than, than intelligence led policing and enforcement of trying to get the guns off the street. You got to do what you're talking about, uh, right? To try to, Make sure that they're securing them, and not leaving them in vehicles, not making it easy for people to get them. But even then, you can go online and get these ghost guns. People sell you components, and you can assemble a, a weapon sure. that is functional, and, and you don't you don't have to have any special talent. So, so I think to me, it's too few parent involvement and too many guns in the hands of kids that aren't old enough to know how to deal with. And, and Sheriff, you took the words right out of my mouth when I started to say when you talk about the call of duty and all of that. And I, I'm a believer, just like you, that that's what's causing these kids to do a lot of stuff is those games of that nature. Listen, I don't know how I got there on the, on the on the GTA game. There is a duplicate of my patrol car on that game. Somebody was smart enough to put my patrol car in that game, and people can pick to choose that. Now, how, now how did that get there? I have no idea, but I've had multiple people ask me, have I seen it? And I have. They've showed it to me. But these kids are they are learning. There's prostitution in that game. There's chases in that game from police. There's, I mean, that's, that is one of the craziest, worst examples of what a kid can do out there. But it's the gamut. I mean, it's drug buying. It's prostitution. It's gamut. It's everything you can think of that they can get away with in real life. And they're learning on that game. I mean, I, you know, uh, it's just something that we never dealt with as kids, and it's exactly. something that we're having to deal with now. I mean, um, and it's just a reality that comes along with our day and age. So, so let me ask this question, and uh, see who would like to take it. Does owning a gun make you safer? Hmm. It can. Yeah, it can. I think if you if if you if you know what the laws are, if you know what the rules are, and you have the proper training and the proper understanding of gun ownership and, and how to use it, then yes, it can it can make you 
Sorry. It can make you safe. It can help you protect yourself and your family and others. Um, I know we've seen across the country where it's not just yourself or your family, but maybe a third party that um, has that, you know, someone carrying a weapon has defended. You know, I, I think that's a different issue than the things we're talking about, about about how violent crimes are, are happening. You know, when we we look at, you know, you, you ask about the, the, AR, the AR-15, you know, to Chief Smith's point, to, to me, the question is, how are they getting them? How are the criminals getting those guns? So it's not really as much about the fact that it's an AR-15. It's more about how, how are they getting that AR-15? You know, are they, you know, how do they have access to that gun so they can commit those crimes? And and so I think that's one one thing we have to address. And we, we see that. I know um, uh, over on the Alabama side, they see it all the time. I mean, we get apartment complexes that are they get hit with entering an autos and, and guns are stolen. I mean, and, and it seems like we get we'll have one of those nights and we may have 30 cars broken into. Well, well I asked that question to go into this in the military. I'm a retired Navy guy. He's a retired Army guy. In the military, we have uh, so much time we have to do on the range. Now, being in the Navy, I didn't have to do as much time on the range as he did being in the Army. But you you have to have so many hours, and I'm talking about hours of, of shooting, learning that weapon, which we talk about doesn't make you safer. So we're, not, we're selling weapons in this country to people and not requiring any kind of safety to come with it. Only that weapon, and I think I that's something that. that we need is uh, required. I mean, we're not going to change the laws right now. It's going to be a bit, but something that could change, possibly the legislature would would even consider, is a safety. Hey, you got to go through this training, this training, in order to have that weapon. I, to to again, I hate to keep referring back to Chief Smith's point, but when you look at when we give driver's license to kids, they have to go through a driver's course. They have to have, you know, on, uh, um, I work in Columbus, but live in Alabama. My kids went to Central. They took their driving course in the high schools, and I know that's not super uh, prevalent across the country anymore, but, I mean, that was a huge benefit to us to have our daughters go through that type of training, and so we, we require it in order for you to drive a car, to get a driver's license and drive a car, but we don't require it for gun ownership. So, I, you know, and, and I, I guess this is a personal uh, opinion, but I, I completely agree with that. I, I don't see any reason, any justification for, for not uh, requiring some type of uh, training uh, and safety course before you purchase a firearm. It just That's seems right. like it makes good sense. Right. Driving a car requires a year of supervisory training before you are allowed to sit in that vehicle by yourself. And, and I want to say this right quick. We're going to take a quick break because we want to bring the Skokie County Sheriff's Office into this uh, process as well. But when you have a car and you get insurance, what do the insurance require? <laughs> They require you sometimes, depending on if you got a ticket or two, to take a safety driving course well, online. Let me just throw this out there because, again, I've been in the middle of the legislative fight. They're going to say that the difference between the two is one is a privilege and one is a constitutional right. They're going to say gun ownership is a fundamental constitutional right of the American citizen. And a driver's license is a privilege. And so they can do more with a privilege and require more than they can with a, a natural born right to bear arms. Because I've heard it till I'm blue in the face. But that, that's what they that's what they tell us. I will tell you one thing before we go to break and to, to bounce off of this. There's there's other countries in the world. It's really not real. People don't talk about it enough, but there are some other countries who have a very similar Second Amendment um, right. Um, yeah, Israel is one, and Sweden is another. One thing that's different between those two industrialized countries and ours, they require 
necessary. Of course, a member, member a military training at a young age before the, as part of their citizenship requirement. And I'd like for us to kick that can down the road. Yeah. That's what I'm thinking about is, is, is something like that. Okay, we're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back and we will have the Muskogee County Sheriff Department joining in on this conversation. In closing, I want to go around to each individual and let them close with something they want the public to know. But we'll start with the mayor. Well, you know, listen, first of all, I appreciate it again, Mr. Mr. Davis and the Board of Pop. I mean, it is, it is something that we, we can't let up on talking about because it really does require everybody in the community to do their part, however small, in trying to prevent some of this gun violence we've seen. You know, most of this stuff happens between people who know each other. They gotta be for one another. Uh, and and I, I think that's important from the sense that we're going right back to what we talked about, about desensitization of, from games or whatever, but or a lack of a good family structure or easy access for guns. Kind of the bottom line is you got young people who are ill-equipped to make the decision of what to do with a weapon to kill people. And, um, so I, I, I would reiterate what, what we were mentioning, and that is if you do see something, say something. You gotta trust law enforcement. Uh, they got a tough job, and it's it's made impossible if they can't. You show up after at a party, bit of shooting, 50 people there, nobody saw anything. Come on. I mean, if you saw something, you can you can do it confidential, but, but let them know. The other piece of this is, is we have to continue to support some of the grassroots operations, whether it's through churches, whether it's through schools, boys clubs, whatever it is. It's our philosophy over here, and I think it's probably the same in, in, uh, on the other side of the river, and that is that we're going to do everything we can to provide resources for young people, alternatives, things that get them on a path where they can become not just a good citizen, but a, but a, a good wager. They can have a good life. We can do that. We have a multitude of, of, of uh, programs. But here's the deal. If they make a conscious decision not to participate, then our focus changes. Then these guys step in and their job is to separate you from people who are doing right for as long as they possibly can so it's going to happen one way or another so what we would just ask you to do is is reach out through your church through your parents through a grandparent through the school they can get you hooked up with resources we have a, we have a kiosk at every almost every one of our rec centers if you don't have a computer you can go to and you can access jobs job training uh, food giveaways any number of resources in privacy going to that kiosk. So there's no excuse if you're looking for a way to try to make some money or get a job or get trained so you can make a job. Um, there are ways to do that besides trying to make it illegally and end up beating these folks up under bad circumstances. Sheriff? Sure. Sure. You know, I, 
One of the things that I would really love the, the community to understand is, and I said this last time, uh, the time to plead your case is in front of a judge or a court. On the side of the road, when a police officer stops you, is not the time to do it. And I watch on social media, it seems like there's this, I don't know, it's a, it's a phenomenon going around the country where everybody thinks that when an officer walks up to their car that they have the right to tell them they're not giving them any information. And it's the farthest thing from the truth. The law is that when you sign your driver's license, you're signing an implied consent that says, if I get stopped for whatever reason, I'm going to give them my ID. I'm going to give them my driver's license. So I don't know where that ever got stopped, started, that we can, we can tell an officer we're not going to give them our license until you tell me what I did wrong. And from there, everything goes downhill. And it's the simplest of things. If you get stopped and it's wrong, there's avenues for that. There's almost everybody in this industry today wears a body camera. If you come and make a complaint to, to Lance or make a complaint to Captain Cooper or make a complaint to me, the, one of the first things we're gonna do is go pull the video. Yeah. What did this person do or say and how did it actually go down? But the initial thought process of, I don't want to give my driver's license to an officer because I don't think I have the right to do that is just not true. If you're driving in the state of Alabama, and I'm assuming it's the same way in Georgia, you're signing an implied consent when you've got that license that says, I don't care what I get stopped for, I'm gonna provide a law enforcement officer my license. And, and if that single thing could, could resolve itself, we would have so many less confrontations with officers on different things, you know, but but I, I just wish that the public would really understand what it is that that is the law versus what they hear on the street, what they consider um, to be, you know, a, a, they know their rights, you know, type. Thing. We call them sea lawyers in the news. Yeah, we, we call them sea lawyers, uh, Chief. There's a lot of takeaways from when we talk. We see here all day and talk, so uh, there's a lot of good information that's shared. But like Lance was talking about, the, the, the guns being stolen in cars, that's probably the biggest factor that if somebody could do something with a gun owner is to secure those vehicles, secure those guns from those vehicles, whether it's a parking lot at a apartment complex or they're out shopping somewhere. Overwhelmingly, the, the guns used in shootings, robberies, any type of violent crime are stolen guns. So that, that's probably the biggest thing, one of the biggest things that I've ever been um, in, in going back to these video games and the, the, the type of weapons that these, it's increasingly younger and younger people are in uh, problems. And the gun of choice is the same guns that they're seeing in these video games. We're seeing kids out here with AR pistols and, you know, not only the, the type of weapon, the weapon of choice, but the amount of rounds that are fired. When I was in Atlanta for 10, 15 years when we were in investigations on the opposite side of the water, we go to a shooting, there may be one, two, three, a couple rounds fired from a handgun. We're going to shootings now where there are 150, 200 rounds shell casings found. And we're seeing multiple calibers, everything from 223, 556 to AK 762 by 39 to 9 to 45 to 40 cal, all at one shooting. <clears throat> so that, that's how out of hand it is with some of the gang violence. And they're heavily armed. Um, you know, it's an uphill battle. We, we, we're doing our best, best that we can. Um, one thing with the media and social media, and, we, and I'm sure uh, CBD as well, we try to 
be involved or watch some of the neighborhood watch groups. And sometimes it's, there's some good information and there's, some, there's a lot of very bad information in those groups and discussion. Oftentimes very critical of law enforcement and what we're doing or how we're doing. The example of the, um, December, we had the shooting right out here on the river walk on double homicide. I believe in that case it was an AR pistol. I'm, yeah, AR, AR pistol, so 30 round magazine. Um, we were able, our investigator did a jam up job where they saw that case pretty quickly, but there was a lot of criticism from the pub, general public on when, the, when it came out. We posted a video uh, that we re received from some surveillance video, a still photo of the event, and we did this as our shooter. And we got some pretty good tips from the public that let us point at us down the right road to make that arrest. But even after that was said and done and we made the arrest, a lot of comments, you know, dozens and even hundreds of comments of that, so that's not the same guy, that's not the guy that you put the crowd of, you guys got the wrong guy. But guess what? Our investigators got a full confession from this penalty. So I beg to differ, I would argue that we do in fact have the right guy. He was confessed and when he come down off his drug induced you know state, state he was he was like uh, Skip mentioned this guy is remorseful and he's concerned about the family. These two families of these victims that he killed that he knew was wrong and now he had remorse. So we're going to continue the good fight. Um, we, one thing that both agencies, the public needs to know is we're short handed. We need help. If you have anybody, fam, friends, family members that are interested in law enforcement, both sides of the river, we'd be glad to have you. And uh, public safety director, y'all make my short. I do appreciate this forum. I appreciate the discussion. I appreciate y'all giving us the opportunity to talk about some of the issues that, are, that we're confronted with and the political implications of some of the policies that are being made. But I will say one last thing for our, for our perspective, the right to bear arms, freedom of speech, the freedom to be free in America, all those rights come with some huge responsibilities. And to your point, I appreciate that the thing about stitching is you're going to be a citizen in this community and you're going to be somebody that's part of this community, then you're obligated to protect this community. That means that being involved, being vocal, making sure that you're part of the protection. And again, going back to, you know, having that faith in law enforcement that we're going to do what we can to protect you. And please come forward. Please let us know. We can do that. Look, we can do a lot of things without even ever divulging victims' names. But that is part of our responsibility to be members of the society. If we're going to have the right to bear arms, we have the right to protect those arms and to train ourselves with those arms. We have the right to live in a safe community. We have the responsibility <coughs> to talk about and, and bring things that are not right in our community to law enforcement's attention so that something can be addressed so that we can continue to have that, that safe, free society. Thank you. Um, Lance, I'll choose. So for, for one thing that I think I'd, I'd like uh, the viewers to uh, to understand is my grandmother used to tell me it takes a village. You've heard your grandparents and your parents talk about it, it takes a village to raise children, it takes a village uh, to, to, to make things run properly. And to that point, it's going to take us all. It's not something, these issues along with other issues, um, we're not going to fix those by ourselves. That is not a single law enforcement issue that has to be dealt with by law enforcement. It is a host of things. It takes law enforcement, it takes uh, politicians, it takes uh, uh, attorneys, it, it takes a host of people. It takes our community, it takes community involvement, it takes community engagement. And I think sometimes we lose the engagement part. You know, we, we have a, you know, we're so busy fighting amongst ourselves that we don't, you know, we don't take the time to say, hey, if we're all just engaged and we all understand that we're, we, we should be fighting for a common cause, we can make this thing a whole lot better. We can make everybody's life better. And it's, it's a much more effective way for, for us as law enforcement officials and for our elected officials to serve our citizens and to make, a, make us a, a safer community and a, and a much better place to live. So that, that would be the thing I would I hope that the, the listeners would understand is that it's going to take us all. This is not single faceted. It's going to take all of us. Okay, uh, Captain. 
Yeah, I, I'm sorry for being late, but um, I pretty much agree with everybody saying for the short time I've been here. But like Lance said, as far as my grandmother, she always told me about as far as being very spiritual, you have 10 commandments. And she always told me commandment number six and commandment number eight. You should not murder, you should not steal. And to me, that's a simple thing to do. Uh, on top of that, like I said, when we go out to communities, like when me and Lance work together in the streets, um, a lot of times the communities look at me a certain way, may look at him a certain way and have a rapport. So sometimes people, especially kids, can be connected to what they see and how you talk to them. So on both sides, I tell them, I say, well, every law enforcement officer, whether they look like me, look like Lance, whatever, we all serve a, one purpose, that's to serve and protect the community. You know, and everybody that I've worked with, you know what I'm saying, we're actually laying our lives uh, for, the, for, for the community, you know, at the same time. Um, and like I say, like at the end of the day, I mean, we all here for one purpose. I mean, we want to go home to our families, you know, the streets want to go home to their families and, what, sure. and whatnot. And um, it just, it's a, in this profession, it's a blessing to do this job. You know, I mean, I love it with a passion. I've been doing it for 24 years. I'll do it for probably 20 more years if I have to, if I'm God willing to do it. Um, I've just been assigned to another side I'm seeing. From, from my law enforcement career, I've been seeing stuff from a different perspective, you know. Uh, we could lock up a, a thousand people, but if we lock up a thousand people, how many opportunities are they going to have when they get out of jail? So if you, if somebody's knocking on the door and they're trying to get inside, defeat their families, whatever, they're gonna, most likely they're going to go to what they normally accustomed to doing. So at the same time, as far as community, you know, we, we're not made here to judge anybody. You know, people need to have second chances. Some may need third chances, you know, but how some people say that we profile law enforcement profiles, the public, at the same time, too, the community profiles law enforcement, which is us. You know, so at the end, at the end of the day, we got both. We got, all got to love each other. We got to like, keep on talking with law, lawmakers as far as changing these gun laws. And at the same time, too, as far as the root of the problem, sometimes it is like, I hate when I'm somewhere about and you have a little kid and the parents saying, oh, he gonna lock you up. I'm like, no, don't do that. You know, and, that, and that's a start from that point. You know what I'm saying? You gotta educate the parents, especially younger parents now, as far as not trying to um, breed their kids for saying that you can't trust the police or whatever, because when they grow up or they see mom or dad being, um, being for, uh, law enforcement come to the household and taking parents away, then that creates a certain atmosphere as far as that kid will be like, oh, they're the enemy. We can't do that. You know, but at the end of the day, it's like I said, we got to love, we got to go home with each other or each other families. And it's basically like Ten Commandments, six and eight. Thou shalt not murder, thou shalt not kill. And you still. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you, Leroy, for having this. Of course, I've learned a lot. I know how beautiful your audience is going tonight. And I'd like to thank everyone here on this panel. But to everyone's point, to the village concept, every community is a village. And so we've heard the perspective from our law enforcement. We cannot be safe going anywhere unless we support our public safety. And so you've heard some of the constraints that they have. First of all, my grandmother said it doesn't hurt anyone to give respect. And you brought up a very good point, Sheriff, is the fact that when something you're stopped, my grandmother used to tell me, whenever you're stopped, she says, first of all, you show respect, you say, yes, sir, no, sir, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am. That's the first thing that you do. And if there's anything wrong, it will come out in the wash. That's what she used to say, that's to your point, sure. And so we realize there are problems. And I want to thank everyone here again, and especially thank you for having this, because I've learned a lot, and I know I've been more than this. And I want to say, you brought up something, Captain Cooper, that uh, I think the public need to be aware of. I worked in, in uh, the treatment courts, okay? And uh, we deal with drug court, uh, mental health court, and veterans treatment court. Columbus have the same thing. Like most of all of the counties in the country is getting the same thing. Like you said, people need a second chance, a third chance, because our prison system is not really treating them. So with the specialty court, we are treating them and we're sending them to facility that's going to treat them, not just lock them up. So we, we, we're sending them off. There may be a six-month program depending on how bad you're on drugs or uh, uh, whether your mental health or whatever, we're sending you away to places for six months for healing and get you off around those people that you are around that doing those drugs or, or whatever. And it works. And sometimes, like you say, this a, may even need a fourth chance. You just can't kick them out of the program. You got to continually work with them. But saying that, and, and I'm going to say this before I close, when I was in Tuscaloosa working with the Tuscaloosa Sheriff's Department, the whole time, the, the, whole time uh, the, the first bank sheriff, I'm in the wrong room. room. We, we, we had a bad crime spree, spree at one time, a lot of killing going on at West Tuscaloosa, on the west side of town. And the sheriff got on the radio, he got so tired, he said, y'all get out of them doggone car, park them, 
and walk wow. down the street and talk to these people, introduce yourself. If they know you, they'll tell you what's going on. But if they don't know you, so go and have a glass of ice water with you. Sit on the push. And we started doing that, and people started telling us things that was going on in their community because they were scared of us. And But once they got used to us, they start uh, opening up to us and let us know what was going on. So again, I say in closing, if you see something, say something because you could be the next victim. Thank you. We'll see you next time. Thank you, everybody, for being on the show.